and give God some praise. Come on, we can do better than that. Let's give God some praise. How many know God is worthy of the glory? He's worthy of the honor. He's worthy of the praise. Amen. Hallelujah. We greet you with Jesus' joy on this morning. Thanking God our Father for this opportunity to stand and declare a word before his people. Amen. I want to thank the angel of this house, and the person of Pastor Eric Thomas for the invitation to come. Amen. To preach on his 15th anniversary. Give God some praise for Pastor Thomas. Amen. Amen. I'm just honored to stand and say a little Sunday school lesson in the place where Pastor Thomas preaches. Amen. Amen. Well, there is a word from the Lord. Are y'all ready for a word this morning? Amen. If you have your Bibles or your smart devices, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. John's Gospel, chapter number 10. I want to focus in on verses 11 through 14. In your own personal private time with God, I would that you would read chapters 10 and 11, which make up the context of this message. John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. If you're there, say amen. amen. I'll do what I do at home. If you're not there, say hold up, wait a minute, let me put my finger near it. Silence being consented, I believe you have it. Here begins the reading of God's Word. And I'm reading from the NIV version of the Bible. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. And the man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As you assume a posture of prayers for the next few moments that are mine to share. I simply want to preach the good shepherd. Turn to your neighbor and say neighbor. Oh neighbor. Aren't you glad we got God as our good shepherd. The good shepherd. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, the power of thy space divine. Let us look now, Lord, to our steadfast hope, allow my will to be lost in thine. Bless me now, O God, as I attempt to preach on your behalf. Allow me, Lord God, to stand and be the mouthpiece for you on this morning. Lord, I thank you for the pen having met the paper, people now having assembled in the pews. But God, we're awaiting the power that comes from on high. Bless now, God, in this sermonic adventure. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The good shepherd. The good shepherd. Beloved, it is important to understand that as God gives pastors and leaders to his church, that Jesus Christ has laid out for us an example that we are to follow as pastors and leaders. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad I serve a God that has laid the foundation for me to follow. A foundation that helps me to understand that I am, as a pastor, supposed to carry myself a certain way. There are certain things that I'm supposed to do. And as I lead God's people, I'm supposed to be responsible for the flock. So here today we have the 15th pastoral anniversary and celebration for one who has been following faithfully the formula that has been laid out by our Christ. And I believe it's understood and needs to be noted that pastors have a hard job. But when we put our hands in God's hands, 
everything will be all right. In particular, beloved, I, I, I see in John's gospel an understanding that throughout the New Testament written, uh, there are several what I call I am statements of Christ. Declarative statements where Jesus begins to assert his messianic authority. Jesus begins to rightfully take ownership of the messianic attributes that belong to him in John's gospel. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus begins to release what I call this op-ed piece in the Bible. So that we can know and see why he is the great I am. All of this centers around thoughts of our text where we focus and hone in on Jesus saying, verse 11 of John's gospel chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. You see, a shepherd is one who cares for the sheep. And the word care denotes a personal touch and ministry of help to those who need to hear a word from God. And even in the world that we live in today with all the great technological advancements of our time, it is interesting to understand that you can't really get care out of automation. We have automated phone systems and all these professional secretaries that answer the phone for us when we don't want to talk to nobody. And we've got automated teller machines in which we don't confront people face to face anymore. But now we can push buttons and get money out or push buttons and push money in. But it does not denote a spirit of care. We have automated vending machines where you can get some food out of a machine not having to interact with anybody. All you got to do is put your dollar bill in and there it is. The food drops in and drops out. But it does not denote a spirit of care. We have automated car washes. Where the machine does the work to make sure that our cars get clean and you have little to no interaction with anybody. And so the spirit of automation does not denote a spirit of care. So the wave of technological advancements have usurped, in my humble opinion, instances where people have been replaced. And now we don't even see a spirit of care. But I thank God for shepherds. Shepherds that are after God's own heart who care for the people of God. And so when we take a look at this, we see that God is reminding all of us that as shepherds, we cannot forget that people should not be subject, should be subjects to be loved and not objects to be used. People should be loved on and cared for and looked after and fed. People should be given the care that they need. And sadly enough, beloved, pre-Katrina, we could find evidence of a lack of care in these United States of America. But I thank God for pastors who are following the formula and the model that God has laid out for his children. In our text, Jesus mentions in verse 11 that he is, keep your Bibles open so you can see and not make anything up, he is the good shepherd. And I believe that this was in response to the predicament in chapter number 9. I believe that Jesus spoke these words because of the mistreatment of the man who is now formerly blind. You all know the story that there was a blind man who was blind from birth and no one could figure out why it was he was born blind. They asked the question, was it his parents who sinned? And Jesus comes back with response that nobody sinned in this instance. But the reason this brother was born blind, so that the glory of God might be revealed to all the children of God. And it is here that as the Pharisees and Sadducees come to examine now this formerly blind man, they said to him, who gave you your sight? And he said, I don't know about anything, but all I know is I once was blind, but now I see. Parents even said, you need to ask him. He can speak for himself. He is of age. And it is here that the Bible says they put the family of the man out as well as the man. He was excommunicated from the church. 
response of Jesus in response to this societal ill comes in, I believe, in chapter 10 with an op-ed piece of letting people know that I am the good shepherd. I care for the flock. He understands that there was a necessity to make sure that people knew that he came to be the shepherd that they needed. And aren't you glad that Jesus is the shepherd over all of our lives? And that God gives us under shepherds who have an understanding of what it means to care for the flock. So in chapter 10, it is a response to the need of the formerly blind man. His brother is in need of some care. And so verse 11 says, watch now, I am the good shepherd. Now, Pastor, in this sentence in the Greek reads as follows. I, I am the shepherd, the good. Reads, I, I am the shepherd, the good. In other words, nobody else is this but me, although there are others who may claim to be shepherds as well. Jesus is saying, I, I am the shepherd, the good. Jesus is different in this regard because Jesus is a genuine shepherd. He is a genuine shepherd. And I don't know about you, but I don't want a facsimile of a God. I, I don't want a carbon copy of a God. I, I, I want a God that I can feel sometime. A God who is genuine in my life. Anybody want anything genuine? Amen. I know there's some sisters out there that don't want a, a facsimile of a man. Amen. There's some brothers out there that don't want a facsimile of a woman. But you want someone who's real and someone who's genuine. Got to make sure you're genuine. And beloved, he says here, I am the good shepherd. I, I am the shepherd, the good. Jesus is distinguishing himself from the rest of the pack. See, beloved, in the Old Testament, Abel was the righteous shepherd. Jacob was the resourceful shepherd. Moses was the returning shepherd. David was the royal shepherd. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So, beloved, if you don't allow me uh, to take this time in the midst of the sermonic presentation, let's give ourselves permission to ask this question. What makes Jesus so good? Can we ask that question? What makes Jesus so good? We're going to give ourselves permission to ask this question of the text. Uh, just how can Jesus be so confident in knowing that he is the good shepherd? If you keep your Bibles with me, amen, I'll show you just a couple of things. Number one, beloved, the reason why Jesus could say emphatically that he was the good shepherd is the Bible says he had knowledge of the flock. Tell your neighbor knowledge of the flock. Verse 14 puts it right here for us for some understanding and clarity. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. The reason why Jesus could emphatically say, I am the good shepherd is because he had knowledge of the flock. Jesus knows his flock. He knows his flock inside and out. And guess what? The flock know him as well. Because we're connected through the knowledge of each other. You got to understand this, that shepherds in ancient Palestine always knew the sheep and vice versa. Shepherds knew sheep so well that even when they would travel and become corralled in different sheep folds, the sheep would know the difference between the shepherd that was leading other sheep and, and the sheep would follow their shepherd knowing because they would know the shepherd inside out and the shepherd would know them. And the reason why was because of an intimate knowledge of the sheep. And this relationship is symbiotic. It is mutual between the shepherd and the sheep. This is an intimate knowledge that helps the shepherd understand certain things about the sheep. See, the shepherd understands and knows our identities. Jesus knows our name. The Bible says he knows the very number of hairs on our head. And because of this, Jesus loves us with all intensity of one. I don't know about you, but I'm glad of that. 
that Jesus, the good shepherd, loves me enough to feel like I'm the only one in the entire world that he cares about. Although he's caring for other people, he knows my name and he knows our identities. We, we, we have a relationship together. Our relationship with him as sheep and shepherd is a deep abiding love. He loves everyone equally, but he shows the same intensity to everybody a part of the flock. And I love this because this is not a unilateral relationship. That's a one-way love, but this is a bilateral relationship, which means I have a demonstration of God's love. That the same love that God gives me in return, I give him because he's been so good to me. My wife knows this, that, 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 that in times gone past, amen. And she knows this. Let me set this up right. She knows this, that, that years ago I used to have an affinity, an affinity for Holly Berry, amen. I used to have an affinity for Holly Berry, amen. But my wife helped me understand something. She said, baby, even from a distance, you can love Holly Berry all you want. But Holly Berry don't even know your name. But I'm glad I serve a God. That he knows my name and I know who he is. And he loves me and I love him. It's not a one-way love. It's a two-way love. Because Jesus knows our identities. But the other thing that helps us understand his knowledge of the flock is he knows our capacities. Our capacities. They shepherd would lead his flock on journeys and it was the shepherd's job to know how long they could travel on these journeys before they had to stop and rest in pastures by rolling hills and waters because if they would travel too far it would kill the sheep and the shepherd knew and understood which sheep needed particular attention versus other sheep that didn't need as much attention. And that's why sometimes, beloved, he knows our capacity. Sometimes the sheep would have to be put on the shoulders of the shepherd because the sheep understood that the, the shepherd understood that the sheep could not go any further. Aren't you glad that there were two foot? prints in the sand, two set of footprints in the sand, but then one set of footprints in the sand. And don't you think that those one set of footprints belong to you? It was the shepherd that was carrying you when you couldn't even carry yourself. Hallelujah. He knows our capacities. He knows how far to stretch us. He knows how far to push us. He knows how far to lead us before we go too far. And there are some times where Jesus had to help us through some things in life because he knew our capacities. I'm so glad that Jesus was able to help somebody through their divorce. I'm so glad that Jesus was able to help somebody through cancer. I'm so glad that Jesus was able to help somebody through underemployment and unemployment. I'm so glad that Jesus carried us when we didn't have food on our tables and Jesus carried us when we didn't have clothes on our backs. Aren't you glad that he knows our capacities? Not only does he know our identities and our capacities, but Jesus also knows our tendencies. Tell your neighbor tendencies. Sheep are a wandering and nomadic animal that sometimes tends to stray from the fold. Uh, they see green grass on another hill. Sheep want to venture off to go to the green grass on another hill. And the reason why the shepherd could easily find the sheep is because he knew the spots where the sheep would stray to. I don't know about you, but I'm glad Jesus knows certain spots that sheep would stray to. Jesus knows your watering holes. Lord have mercy. He knows your hangout spots. He knows the places you go after church. He knows the places you go during the week. He knows our tendencies to stray. And I know somebody sitting there like super Christian saying, well, I ain't strayed nowhere. Don't think you all that because you haven't strayed. 
just haven't found the right set of grass yet. I hope I get that. Aren't you glad he knows where to find us? And he knows where we tend to go off to. And he knows where we tend to trip. But he loves us enough to come and get us. He loves us enough to bring us back. And so I thought I had a church here that understood that Jesus knows how to rescue us when we get too far off to the side. Jesus knows our tendency. But beloved, I want to give you something else. He not only has intimate knowledge of the flock, uh, but the second thing is he is discontent with the size of the flock. The reason why Jesus is the good shepherd is because he's discontented with the size of the flock. Keep your Bibles open. It's right here. Verse number 16. The Bible lets us know that I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. And I must bring them also. And there shall be one flock. Jesus came to shift the paradigm of church. Watch it. From a fold mentality to a flock mentality. Let me, let me see if I can unpack this. Uh, a fold details the circumference or the walls around the sheep. But the flock details the center and who's at the center of the sheep. The fold focuses on what's around them. But a flock mentality focuses on, on, on who's among them. The fold representative of Israel as a nation. But the flock is representative of the Jews and Gentiles that God was trying to bring into the kingdom. So the flock is unlimited because all barriers have been broken. Lord have mercy. No walls around us to limit us. No barriers to preclude us from coming to Christ. Nothing is there to keep us from coming to the Good Shepherd. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad about that today. That Jesus didn't throw up any walls. No walls. To keep people out or keep people in. You'll get that on your way home. Amen. No walls. To block us from coming in or coming out. But I thank God I have unlimited access. And anytime I need my Savior, Lord have mercy. All I got to do is call on His name. And Jesus will come and see about me. Not yet. I'm almost there. Not yet. Amen. You need to understand, beloved, that Jesus is there because He's discontented with the size of the flock. So the Bible says, he says, other sheep I have that are not of the sheepfold. Notice Jesus says uh, that they're not in the sheepfold yet. Other sheep I have that are not of the sheepfold, but they just don't know it yet that they're already a part of me. So you got some people still selling crack that belongs to Christ. He still got some people pushing drugs that belong to him. Uh, he's got some people that are still out there sinning. That he wants to bring home and become a part of the flock. Amen. And I'm so glad that Jesus looked past my faults. And he saw my needs. See, the world would get rid of us. The world would discard us. The world would put us away. And I'm so glad I serve a Savior. That can change a hustler into a holy man. A pimp into a preacher. A crackhead into a choir man. A drug dealer into a deacon. I'm so glad that Jesus is an equal opportunity employer. He doesn't discriminate based on your past. But he loves you enough to bring you in the fold. Aren't you glad? Maybe there's someone in here that want to testify to the fact that God saw you where you were. And he picked you up and turned you around and placed your feet on solid ground. I'm so glad I serve a Savior that saw the best in me. A Savior that looked at me and said there's something of value on the inside of me. This is what makes Jesus the good shepherd. Amen. 
Not only because he has knowledge of the flock. Not only because he is discontented with the size of the flock. Because one day the scattered will become the gathered. But let me go a little bit deeper and ask the question. Amen. Uh, the final thing, beloved, is he is also, uh, say is also sacrificed for the flock. Tell your neighbor, the good shepherd sacrifices for the flock. Watch the text. Now, at least three times, Pastor Thomas, uh, it is mentioned in the text that he was willing to lay down his life. At least three times it's mentioned in the text that he's willing to lay down his life in the text. He compares and contrasts himself. I'm not making anything up. It's right here in the book. With the hired hand. And he said, I, there's a difference between a shepherd and a hired hand. There's a difference between the shepherd and the hired hand. And, and sometimes when the shepherd could not be there, sheep a uh, shepherd who owned the sheep would hire someone to watch the sheep. He would solicit the help of a hired hand. Now, the hired hand had no investment in the sheep. The hired hand had no investment in their upbringing, no investment in their growth, no investment in their discipline, no investment in their development. The other thing is the difference between the shepherd and the hired hand is the hired hand would draw the line when trouble came. God have mercy. You don't know who your friends are when you get in trouble. You know who's got your back and who doesn't. Ah uh, yes, when, when trouble comes in your life, either they'll turn tail and run. Or they'll come close to you and help you in the time of need. You see, the trouble, trouble is an indicator on who would help and who would hurt. And so when the wolf would attack the hired hand, would then allow them to remain in trouble. Why? Because he had no interest. He had no vested interest in the sheep. Aren't you glad you got a pastor that has a vested interest in the sheep? Pastor who has labored here for 15 years wanting to make sure that you grow and are developed and become disciplined in the ways of God. A lot of times, beloved, we get people in our lives who are modern day prophets. I'm not talking about P-R-O-P-H-E-T. I'm talking about P-R-O-F-I-T-S. All they're interested in is what they can get from you and how they can get it from you the best they can I'm thanking God for the good shepherd we must be then in the hands of the good shepherd watch it you must understand that Jesus' sacrifice is vicarious which means he does it for the sake of someone else that's some of the most important prepositional word in the entire Bible it's three letters, four, F-O-R. Four is the most important preposition in the entire Bible because four helps us to vicariously enjoy what Jesus brings to us. Let's look at it. The Bible says, for he who the Son sets free. I thought I had Bible readers. It's free indeed. Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus was made sin for us. Y'all got it? If God be for us, who can be against us? All things work together for the good and for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And so the most important position in the entire Bible is that word for because it helps us to enjoy what we don't deserve and it helps us to understand the blessings that the shepherd is giving us because the shepherd wants us to enjoy it vicariously nudge your neighbor and say vicarious if the shepherd sacrificed himself it is then for us to enjoy what the shepherd provides and although if the shepherd suffers loss, it was not because of the wolf coming to the shepherd. 
but it was because of the wolf coming to the sheep. The wolf was after the sheep and the shepherd did not have to suffer loss, but he stepped in my place when I should have died at the hands of the wolf. That's why he is the good shepherd. Y'all sit down, you're making me nervous. I'm almost done. He helps us to see that we enjoy the sacrificial uh, parts of the shepherd vicariously. But we also enjoy what Jesus provides voluntarily to us. Nudge your neighbor and say voluntarily. In other words, Jesus could have stayed in glory with the Father. But the Bible says he volunteered at the beginning of time to come and see a wretch like you and me. Jesus could have stayed with his mother and father, Joseph and Mary, and lived a normal life. But at the age of 12, Jesus said, I now must be about my father's business. Voluntarily doing what he needed to do. In other words, Jesus could have stayed in Bethany and never went to Jerusalem to go and die on the cross. But he voluntarily went up the Via Della Rosa and was nailed on Calvary's cross that we might have a right to the tree of life. See, that's what a good shepherd does. They voluntarily give of themselves so that people might have what they need. He says, I lay it down freely. Nails in my hands. Spikes in my feet. A thorn on my head. A sword through my side. Blood from my body. But it's worth it. Because my children are involved. Aren't you glad? He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Let me close here. Not only is he sacrificial, giving us vicariously an opportunity to enjoy blessings. And not only is Jesus voluntarily giving us what we enjoy. But finally, Jesus shows us that he is the good shepherd. Because Jesus gives us the victory. Nudge your neighbor and say the victory. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done. God puts in place a plan for his children so that we might enjoy the victory that has already been won. Can I preach it like I feel it? Amen. He said, I want you to understand that you've got victory through me. No matter who talks about you, no matter who maligns your name, no matter who says anything against you, you've got the victory through Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but that's what makes Jesus so good to me. He's good to me because he laid down his life for me. He's good to me because on the third day morning, he took it back up again. He's good to me because he loves me so. And aren't you glad? Slap five with your neighbor and said, I'm glad for the victory in my life. Pastor, let me close it like this. The Huffington Post put in the paper, January 2013, there was a woman that was having a jewelry party whose name was Jackie Hagler. Jackie Hagler had 15 of her girlfriends over to her house in Lake City, Florida. This is a true story. You can look it up when you get home. And Jackie Hagler had 15 of her girls over looking at jewelry and sipping a little something. I don't know what they were sipping. They been but they were sipping a little something, amen. And the story goes all of a sudden, a 24-year-old man by the name of Derek Lee breaks into the house, breaks up the jewelry party, and says to all of the people, give me all your money and all your jewelry. And he pulls a gun out on Jackie Hackett. All 15 of her girlfriends went running everywhere, amen. Where are my friends? Friends when I need them, they started hiding. Jackie just froze in the midst of Derek Lee pointing the nine millimeter gun in her face, and she got frightened. And Derek Lee said, "I told you, woman, give me all your jewelry and all your money." But then all 
of a sudden, something happened in Jackie. For she said these words, true story, in the name of Jesus, get out of my house. And all of a sudden, she started feeling a little better. He said, listen, woman, don't you know that I'm pointing a gun in your face and that I have the power to, in the midst of everything? And she said, in the name of Jesus, oh, Lord, get out of my house. He said, I'm holding a nine millimeter. The bullets are filled to capacity. Don't you know I could take you out right here? right now and for a third time she said in the name of Jesus get out of my house all of a sudden the women stopped hiding and this is what they did they said Jesus 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 they started chanting Jesus Jackie and her girls were not going to back down Derek Lee started trembling the story goes Derek Lee got afraid although he thought he had all the power he found out he didn't have any power because how many know there's power in the name of Jesus there's liberty in the name of Jesus oh there's joy Somebody ought to slap by with your neighbor and say, I've got victory in the name of Jesus. Whenever I call on the name of the Lord, he will come and see about me. Say yes, yes, yes. I feel all right today. Anybody in here know you've got victory. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're feeling right now, just call on the name of the Lord and he will be by your side. Is there a witness in the building that know there's power, 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 wonder working power in the blood, in the blood, all of the blood of the Lamb your hearts may the Lord God bless you real good but you got a good shepherd over there y'all take care of him and he'll take care of you y'all stand by him and he'll stand by you aren't you glad that you got a savior that can give you power when you need it give God some glory give God some praise But I just stopped by to say and stopped by to share with you that Jesus is the good shepherd. I know you go through difficulties sometimes. I know you go through hardships. Pastor said I could be free. Sometimes you got to understand when the storms keep on raging in your life. You gotta understand that God is there for you. Can I sing my little song just a little bit? Oh, the storms keep on raging in my life. And sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day. That hope that lies within it reassures. Thank you, Jesus. As I keep my eyes upon the distant shore, I know you'll lead me safe to that blessed place He has prepared. 
what I like about it, y'all.
goodness and how he set me free. Goodness, what he done for me? Look at his goodness.